Hello, this is Michael Sulak, and this is the third in a series of videos going through my second college algebra exam. And this is question number four, and it says for the following rational function, which is right here. Before we go any further, let's just remind ourselves that a rational function basically just means it's a big fraction. To be a little bit more specific, the top is a polynomial and the bottom is a polynomial. Let's start with part A here. So let's find the domain. So the domain are all the possible x's. They're all the numbers that I could put into this particular function for x. I always like to ask myself, is there any potential for problems? And with fractions, there definitely are. You cannot divide by zero. So the bottom of this function can't be zero. So we wanna know where does this happen? This is the same procedure anytime you're finding the domain of something that's a fraction, is you set the bottom equal to zero. So we're just gonna take the denominator and set that equal to zero and then we have to solve this and you could use the quadratic formula this is a quadratic equation it has an x squared but this is going to factor it's going to factor i have a minus sign and a positive sign here so these two numbers that come second need to both multiply together to give me minus four. I have to have a negative and a positive. And so because this sign is positive, I know that my positive number needs to be the larger one. If you think about it for a bit, this has to factor into x plus four and x minus one. Now I have the bottom in factored form and I'm trying to solve where that equals zero. When you're multiplying things together, the whole thing will be zero if either piece is zero. So we have x minus one could equal zero or x plus four could equal zero. So if I added one to both sides, I would get x equals one here. And if I subtracted four from both sides here, I would get x equals negative four. These are the problems because they are the values of x that are actually not possible. And so these are gonna be the only values actually that are not possible. So our domain is gonna exclude those two. If I'm going to end up writing it as an interval, there's many ways you could write the domain, but I constantly am making these pictures where I've got a number line here. I'm thinking about X's. These, the domain is always about X's and I need to exclude these two numbers and include everything else. So what happens is the domain in a picture form looks like this but a lot of times we write it as an interval and what that's going to look like is an interval for this bottom piece which we write negative infinity to say there's no limit on the smallest x can be it can go up and up and up and up and up until it gets to negative four we don't want to include negative four so we use a parentheses we're going to say union to describe the idea that it's this interval or it could be in here. And that interval is going to be from negative four up to the highest value one. And we don't want to include these endpoints or it could also be in this third region, which starts at one and X can be as big as it wants. So that's going to go up to infinity. And as an interval, our domain looks like this. There are three regions. So now let's find the y-intercept, which I've said that this is one of the easier problems you could be asked to do, because all you need to do is figure out what is y when x equals zero, because at the y-intercept, x is always zero. In order to answer this question, we're going to evaluate the function at zero. We're putting in x is zero here. So we're going back to the original function and we're putting in zero for every value of x. And this is gonna simplify down quite a bit. These pink terms are all zero. So we get what's left over. We're 
positive 10 over negative 4, which we tend to write with the negative sign out in front because it doesn't really matter. If I wanted to simplify that a little bit, that would simplify down to 5 halves. So the y-intercept is, it's technically a point, so maybe we should remind ourselves that what we just found is just the value of y. The y-intercept itself is the point x is 0 and y is negative 5 halves. The next part asks us for vertical asymptotes, and these only happen with rational functions, and they occur where the bottom is 0. They occur at the problem values. They always occur at the values of x that make the bottom 0. Because the vertical asymptotes, if you remember, they're these invisible vertical lines that the function is split by. It never crosses vertical asymptotes. So does this have vertical asymptotes? It does. So they're going to be at x equals 1 and x equals negative 4. The vertical asymptotes themselves are lines. So I could imagine that there's going to be one going here because that's where x equals 1 and there's going to be one, excuse my bad writing here, at here. But the vertical asymptotes are the equations of these two vertical lines and the equations of vertical lines look like x equals some number. So we have two lines, two vertical asymptotes for this rational function. So then they're asking for, if, are there any horizontal asymptotes? These require a bit more thought. I've gone ahead and just rewritten the function here in slightly questionable handwriting. I like to think about the horizontal asymptotes as the answer to, does y approach any number if x gets really big or really small. If x gets really, really big, what happens to this fraction? And horizontal asymptotes are slightly challenging, but you can think about it as which is growing quicker, the top or the bottom. And so in order to figure out what's going on, we look at the degree of the top, which is 2, and the degree of the bottom, which is 2, and they have the same degree. So if the degree of the top and the degree of the bottom is the same, then there is a horizontal asymptote, guaranteed. And to find it, this is going to occur at the coefficient of, of the leading term of the top divided by the same idea but with the bottom, the coefficient of the leading term on the bottom. And the coefficient of the leading term on the top is a negative 1, and the coefficient of the leading term on the bottom is a positive 1. When we say term, again, we are referring to the entire piece here that's separated by the plus sign. They both have coefficients of 1, but the top is negative because there's a negative sign here. Will this approach a number? It will. And when x gets really, really big, y is going to get close to negative 1. And the same thing is going to happen if x gets really, really small. So if we were going to be very precise about the horizontal asymptote, it is going to have a horizontal asymptote. And the equation of a horizontal line looks like y equals something. And so our horizontal asymptote is going to be given by the equation y equals negative 1. And actually my picture is in a bad place here. The horizontal asymptote certainly be below the x-axis because it's negative. So now it says sketch this graph. I'm going to give just a general idea of what this thing looks like, focusing on where the asymptotes go and whether it's positive or negative. And we've we already know that there's two vertical asymptotes here, and I could think about there is going to be a horizontal asymptote right here at y equals negative 1. So the question is, what does it do? It's definitely not going to cross the vertical asymptotes. It never crosses vertical asymptotes. It could cross its horizontal asymptotes. It's kind of confusing. So at this point, I might realize a smart thing to do is to bust out the old TI. I'm going to take this equation and put it into my calculator. I need to go up to the y equals. And because this is a uh, rational function that 
has a fraction. When you're dealing with slightly complicated things in the top and bottom, you want to be sure you put those in parentheses. And I just found out that this button right here, this X, T, Omega, whatever button, that's the quickest way to get the letter X. I didn't know that for years. But now I do, so I'm going to use it. And the quickest way to get a squared is to hit this button. And so now I'm going to do plus 10, and I'm going to end that parentheses. So I've got the top in there. Now I'm going to divide that by, and I'm going to start another parentheses and hit that same um, button right here under mode to get that letter X in there. And then I'm going to hit the same squared button, and then I'm going to plus, and then 3, and then this is slightly confusing. For the negative X squared on the top, I had to use this button down here, the negative sign beside the decimal point. But to do subtraction, you have to use the subtraction symbol, which is slightly longer looking and occurs right over the addition symbol. So minus four, I'm going to close that and then I'm going to hit the graph button here in the top right. What I'm seeing are the pieces of this function that are split by those two vertical asymptotes there. And you can see that these, the piece on the left here and the piece on the right are approaching that value of negative one, that horizontal asymptote that we have. I'm going to be a little bit casual about my graph. I'm going to be sure that I get the right intercepts and I might want to know where the x-intercepts of this thing are. I haven't found those. And if I hit the table, I can see that any y value of 0 is the x-intercept. And if I mess around here, I need to find the x-intercepts on here. And it, it turns out I can't actually use the table to find the x-intercepts, but I could look back at my original function. And if you want to know where the whole fraction is zero, all you have to do is set the top equal to zero because the only time a fraction can ever be zero is if the top is equal to zero. So the x-intercepts are going to occur when the top is equal to zero. So I'm going to get 10 equals x squared. And so don't forget, when you solve something like this by taking the square root of both sides, you're going to get a plus or minus. There's going to be two values here. Plus or minus the square root of 10 are the values of x where it crosses the x-axis. And that's about 3.16. Let's go ahead and get back to this graph. And remember that these 3.16 are going to be values of the x-intercept. So I could go ahead. It's going to cross at a little bit more than 3 here. It's going to cross at a little less than 3 over here. And let's go back and look at the calculator's graph. If you were a NASA scientist, you'd be a little bit more careful with the rest of the points. But my main concern is, are the, the x-intercepts are in the right place? If you remember, this value was the y-intercept. That is equal to negative 2.5. So this graph is going to cross halfway between 2 and 3. I'm going to have this region on the left. So this piece here is going to sort of come out and approach here. And I, maybe I'll put arrows to remind myself this goes forever. So this middle piece is going to be this S. And notice this function is definitely crossing its horizontal asymptote. The horizontal asymptote, again, was that line y equals negative 1. It was this thing right here. And the vertical asymptotes are the, these lines right here. Sorry, it's hard for me to draw straight up and down with this thing. Ooh, those look like crap. Imagine they're straight. So anyway, this middle piece needs to come down, go through this point, go through this point, and approach this thing. And I'm going to try my best to make it look good, but it's hard for me to write vertically. So here we go, cut right, ooh, and then get closer, never touch. Ooh, it almost looks like it touches, whatever. That's as good as it's going to get for right now. So there's the middle piece, and then the right piece is going to come down from its vertical asymptote, cross at this x-intercept, and then sort of be like a plane landing on its horizontal asymptote. That is the 
picture of this graph. I mean, this is a better looking picture on the calculator, and this is my rugged interpretation of that picture. Things are kind of hard to draw. Rational functions are challenging. When you're drawing them, it's really important, I think, to first go ahead and put the vertical and horizontal asymptotes there to give you an idea of where these curves are going to go to. And then it's not necessarily required depending on your teacher. I wouldn't expect my students to get these X and Y intercepts perfectly on here um, if the directions don't ask for it. But I like to include those when I'm drawing this picture just so my picture looks slightly better than uh, kindergarten -y. So this is the graph of this rational function. It has two vertical asymptotes because that's where the bottom is zero. It has one horizontal asymptote because the top and bottom were basically changing at approximately the same rate. So the smaller x gets, the closer y gets to negative one, and the bigger x gets, the closer y gets to negative one as well. So that is working with a rational function.